the other ossification process that occurs in, in the, occurs in the fetus called endochondral ossification. This ossification process is the most common way in which our bones are formed. While intramembranous ossification only gives rise to some of the flat skull bones and the clavicles, what we find is that endochondral ossification gives rise to pretty much all the other bones. We will study endochondral ossification by using a long bone as our model. Now we can summarize this whole process in these three bullets that I have listed here, and that which say that we start out in the case of endochondral ossification not with a model of uh, mesenchyme cells with just a bunch of fibers. Instead, this time the mesenchyme cells are going to build a, a structure, a hyaline cartilage structure that is kind of elongated as if it's on its way to building a long bone. So the cartilage model forms the foundation for ossification, not just this fibrous membrane that we saw in intramembranous ossification. And literally what's going to have to happen is that the hyaline cartilage is going to have to fall apart to then be able to deposit the osteoid, which gets mineralized. In other words, we go through the process of ossification. Remember what the term endochondral ossification means. Endo means within, and chondro always refers to cartilage. We will use this slide just to get us started, but it has a lot of information in it, and I'm going to break down by doing my own sketches again, just like I did for intramembranous ossification. We're going to see some major steps though, and that is that our piece of cartilage, our piece of hyaline cartilage that differentiated from the very early mesenchyme cells, uh, remember it is going to be surrounded by perichondrium, um, and that perichondrium is going to become periosteum. So it's going to differentiate into periosteum. And remember, anytime we have periosteum, we always also have what kinds of cells? We have osteoblasts, osteoclasts, and we need to assume that there are also osteoprogenitor cells that can give rise to the osteoblasts. If we have osteoblasts, they can start building bone tissue. In other words, we're going to see that we can begin to form a bone color. Um, while that process is happening, that is the formation of our bone color on the inside of our structure. You can see some evidence of that over here and over here. The inside of our structure is literally going to fall apart. And um, when we start to see the falling apart of the cartilage, little spaces are created with little remnants of cartilage or little spicules of cartilage left. But there's enough space now to where we can bring in blood, and you can see that happening here, blood is entering um, into the little shaft there of the cartilage piece that is beginning to fall apart. And if we can bring in blood, then we can also bring in osteoblasts and osteoclasts and the components of uh, our bone marrows. And therefore, once that happens, when we bring in osteoblasts, what do osteoblasts do again? They secrete osteoid. They can therefore um, lead to the, the formation of trabeculae and spongy bone tissue and possibly even compact bone tissue. We're going to see that the medullary cavity is formed because we're going to, after bone tissue is built, we're going to break it down with the help of the osteoclasts. So this is a bit of a summary of this series of images that you see from A, B, C, all the way to F right here. Now, just like we did for intramembranous ossification, we really need to remind ourselves of what our goal is for endochondral ossification. We're going to try to, to form a long bone. So if we just sketch a you know, typical long bone, we need to have a diaphysis. You know all of this already from studying your bone anatomy with the ends, which we refer to as the epiphyses. 
You know, it's kind of a silly diagram, but it's just to make a point. So I'll just use some abbreviations here. Um, I think you know by now what they mean. The diaphysis here. Inside the, of the diaphysis, we're going to have our medullary cavity, MC for medullary cavity. We find that the epiphyses are going to be covered with articular cartilage. And what kind of tissue makes up the articular cartilage, you guys? That is, of course, hyaline cartilage, right? Articular cartilage. And we are also going to see in a bone that hasn't finished growing that we're going to be left with a band of cartilage pretty much in between or in that vicinity between the epiphyses or epi one epiphysis and diaphysis. And as you know, these are the so-called epiphyseal plates or you can call them epiphyseal discs in layman's terms. We call these... Um, growth plates. We also should add wh what kinds of bone mem membranes we need. We're going to need some periosteum on the outside of the diaphysis, like so. And remember that the periosteum contains your bone cells except for osteocytes, because osteocytes are located inside of mature, fully formed, hardened bone tissue. And we also have endosteum lining the medullary cavity, which is also made up of our bone cells, except for osteocytes. Now, what kind of bone tissue do we need where? We need primarily spongy bone tissue in the epiphyses that eventually becomes invaded with <clears throat> red bone marrow. On the other hand, we are going to see that our bone color is going to be primarily compact bone tissue. So our bone color is going to be primarily compact bone tissue. Now we're going to, you know, if we really look at a bone closely, there is actually some spongy bone tissue just deep to the, the endosteum. And there is going to be a, a thin layer of compact bone tissue uh, towards the periphery of the epiphyses. And, and this is, of course, to give it some strength. But really, primarily, we want here in the epiphyses spongy bone tissue. We want our epiphyseal plates and articular cartilage to be made up of hyaline cartilage. Our bone color should be primarily compact bone tissue. So this is our goal for endochondral ossification, and we can't forget that. So let's start sketching out endochondral ossification to the best of our ability. So let's, let's assume we need to build a humerus or a femur or any of the long bones, maybe one of the phalanges in your fingers. What's going to happen in the feet is again at about six to eight weeks, or I, sh I should say prior to six to eight weeks, because that would be when ossification starts. But prior to that, we're going to have this you know, little structure of cartilage right there and um, it's going to be covered with some perichondrium. Again, this is not going to be the prettiest sketch per se. It's just to make a point. And that piece of cartilage is going to go through some growth because the cartilage cells will divide. So they go through mitotic divisions. And sometimes it's a little hard to write on the screen of my iPad here, so I apologize about the screen scribbles, but the cartilage divide, and I'm going to already tell you what that's, how that's often referred to. We talk about interstitial growth, because we will see this term again in the future. And of course, if the cartilage cells divide, what's going to happen to our cartilage structure? It gets bigger. So maybe now it's a little bit bigger like so. And again here, the purple squigglies represent its perichondrium. Alrighty. So let's say now that we are, as a fetus, about six to eight weeks old. 
And now it's time for ossification to get started. And one of the first things we're going to see is that the perichondrium becomes periosteum. So the, somehow the perichondrium around the cartilagin structure reaches a, sta reaches a stage or reaches a level of maturity. I'm not quite exactly sure what triggers it, but it becomes periosteum. So now we have our cartilage structure with, and of course it continues to grow, with its double-layered periosteum around it. And I need you to remember that that periosteum has osteoblasts and osteoclasts in it. And that means, therefore, that the osteoblasts can start secreting osteoid onto our existing piece of cartilage. In other words, these osteoblasts are now squeezing osteoid in between, in between the periosteum and the existing cartilage. I hope that makes sense. And of course, what happens to that um, osteoid? It is going to become mineralized And when it does that, we start to form trabeculae and our osteoblasts become osteocytes. In this situation, once again, we're going to see that the trabeculae are going to continue growing bigger. And that ultimately results into the formation of compact bone tissue. Therefore, if we now add picture number four, let's say, we should have a structure that is still primarily cartilage, but it's beginning to show signs of the formation of some compact bone tissue. So we're beginning to strengthen the outside of our piece of cartilage. Um, we still have our periosteum here, but we're seeing that the outside needs to be strengthened and this is because what's going to happen now is that the cartilage cells, which I'll draw in blue here, especially in the very center, and you need to assume that they sit in, in lacunae, especially in the very center of our structure, these cartilage cells are going to start dying. Now, how do they do this? Well, first of all, where this is occurring, we refer to now as an ossification center again, but we're going to be a little bit more specific and refer to it as the primary ossification center. In intramembranous ossification, we only had one ossification center. You're going to see that in the formation of a long bone, we're going to have at least two ossification centers. And the secondary ones are going to be in the epiphyses. And we're not quite ready to get to, to talk about the epiphyses yet. So in that primary ossification center, the cartilage cells are going to die. To die, literally they commit, uh, they're forced to die. They basically go through a process of apoptosis. And how do they do that? Well, first, they're going to be triggered to hypertrophy. So the cartilage cells are triggered to hypertrophy. And what does that mean to hypertrophy? It means that they grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Trophy always means growth. Hyper means more growth. So they grow bigger and bigger. The problem is that if they do grow bigger like that, they cannot, it, it, it triggers the hardening of the cartilage matrix. So now we're going to see that the cartilage matrix around them calcifies, it hardens. And this has further consequences because if 
the cartilage matrix around these huge cells calcifies, it's very difficult for nutrients to reach these big cells. So nutrients cannot diffuse to the cells anymore. And consequently, the cells die. So our cells die, and when the cells die, they also cannot maintain the cartilage matrix anymore. And what we're seeing happening is that little spaces start to appear where the cartilage cells are dying and where the cartilage matrix is slowly but surely go starting to deteriorate. So in our next picture, I think we're at step five. What we find now is that we still have little chunks of cartilage left. I'm going to just show in this primary ossification center, realize that the cartilage cells are dying and the matrix is dying little by little. All right, this is all occurring gradually. And so C for little cartilage spicules or cartilage chunks or cartilage remnants. We have our bone color that is in the process of forming on the outside. You know, as it started, it continues, of, of course. And then we still have mostly our uh, epiphyses, and I'm not going to draw much of the rest here. Uh, of the structure, and let's not forget we also have our periosteum. Okay, so now that we have literally just little chunks of cartilage left, and they are still deteriorating too, um, there is now literally space for something to move in. And we're going to refer to the structure that moves into this primary ossification center as the periosteal bud. Now, the OpenStax book does not use that terminology, but I still would like for you to be aware of the fact that that's what it's called. Actually, allow me to use a very different color. Let's just use bright green to illustrate it. So this structure here that I'm showing to you in the bright green is our periosteal bud. And it contains blood vessels with that bring in osteoblasts and osteoclasts and osteoprogenitor cells, you can assume, and the components and blood cells that are going to form our red bone marrow eventually. Because remember in children, I forgot to mention that when we drew a typical long bone, in children that medullary cavity is primarily, is, is at first going to be filled with red bone marrow. So again, inside of this periosteal bud, we're finding blood vessels that bring in osteoblasts, osteoclast blood cells in the red bone marrow. Or I should uh, maybe specify that, or just say blood vessel, um, that is that nutrient artery. Well, when we bring in osteoblasts, and also osteoclasts, but especially these osteoblasts, what they're going to be able to do now is to deposit themselves, and I'll use again a different color, let's say I use purple for the osteoblasts now, they're going to deposit themselves on top of these little spicules of cartilage that are slowly but surely disintegrating or deteriorating. And when they do that, they do their job. And what is the job of these osteoclasts? It is to secrete osteoid around them. So they use these little remnants of cartilage as little, I, I don't know, as, as little platforms to start secreting the osteoid. And what happens when osteoblasts secrete osteoid, it's becoming kind of old news now, the osteoid starts to become mineralized 
and then we be begin to form trabeculae. At the same time, our osteoblasts turn into osteocytes. Now, we know that we shouldn't be forming, well, I should say, we know that we, we don't want trabeculae only in that medullary cavity. We, we need a little bit of trabeculae forming around the medullary cavity, yes, but really what we need is our medullary cavity, right? Therefore, our osteoclasts are going to come in and they're going to be munching away at those trabeculae, which then ultimately leads to the formation of our medullary cavity. So here in picture six, we have the formation of the trabeculae in the center, in the primary ossification center. We still have quite a bit of cartilage left because everything is just occurring gradually, but certainly we have, um, let's see here, we have especially towards one end where the epiphyses are, lots of cartilage still left. We have some compact bone tissue already with the periosteum. Okay, nothing has happened yet in those epiphyses, by the way. And then I just explained to you that the trabeculae are going to be replaced, or I should say, digested by the osteoclasts. And why? So that we can form a medullary cavity. So we're beginning to now form that medullary cavity. You know, it will not have a really nice shape yet, MC for medullary cavity, um, while we still have the remainder of the cartilage or compact bone tissue and our periosteum. Okay, so this process continues for a while, so keep in mind that we continue to work on our building our periosteum. It needs to, of course, grow bigger as our, as our structure gets bigger. These cartilage cells that are still around and are still in good shape continue to divide to, to even make our cartilaginous portion bigger while things on the very inside of our cartilaginous structure begin to fall apart, meaning our cells hypertrophied and ultimately that led to their death. And once there, is, once, once there are spaces due to the death of the cartilage cells in this primary ossification center, then our uh, periosteal bud can move in and bring in the materials needed in order to build bone tissue and break it down. So we should also draw here our periosteal bud, like so, that brought in all of those materials. And this is picture seven. And so this is pretty much the time at which a baby gets ready to be born. So once we have begun to form that medullary cavity, and it probably would be a bit bigger, uh, we're pretty close to being born, or we have been born. So what about those epiphyses? Well, the epiphyses are going to go through the exact same process, except that the epiphyses do not start developing until right around birth or after birth. That's one thing that is different. And secondly, a second major difference is that the epiphyses are not going to need to form a medullary cavity, obviously, but they will also, sorry, they will also receive a um, periosteal bud, which will then ultimately lead to the formation of trabeculae. So ultimately, slowly but surely, woven bone tissue that eventually becomes mature spongy bone tissue will form here, well after birth. We do not need to form an, a medullary cavity in these epiphyses, but are the osteoclasts going to play a role here? You bet, osteoclasts are going to be needed 
to give this epiphysis some shape, to shape the trabeculae. Um, you know, you're learning in lab about all the bone markings. So maybe a hole or a groove or some roughness needs to be produced um, close to uh, the area of the diaphysis, nearby the epiphyses, etc., etc. Let's not forget, too, I forgot to draw this, but we are still seeing some, um, despite the fact that the epiphyses will form, let's not forget that there is a good-sized band that will not, right here, this epiphyseal plate of cartilage will not ossify until we hit puberty. And that will lead us eventually to a discussion on what happens to our bones when we grow as children.